Oh, yeah. Okay. It is a very special pleasure to present Ai Weiwei and Uli Sik together here in Zwartz for when it comes to the recent history of Chinese contemporary art, these two are truly outstanding exponents. Ai Weiwei hardly needs to be introduced. He's the best known Chinese artist of the present day. His works and his career have influenced the art scene of the past 20 years on the broadest level. He has presented his work in documentas and biennales and in the most important museums. And what is also important, in his time when he lived as a young artist in New York, between 1983 and 19. 93, he was already part of that Chinese scene of artists who moved to New York to free them, themselves from the repressions they were exposed to in their home country at the time. And I would like to introduce Uli Sik from my personal Swiss point of view, because here in Switzerland, we heard early on about the specific new Chinese contemporary art. And this was always immediately associated with the name Ulisik. We heard that, uh, that a young generation was venturing a new departure. Many questions arose immediately because everything was new and difficult to classify. And one asked, for example, are we only projecting our own Western ideals and criteria into what we see? Uli and Rita Sik had an open house and presented many things and mediated and told. Because Uli had been Swiss ambassador to, to China and Korea from 1995 to 1998. He not only became an important witness of the awakening, he also started to collect art immediately. And since 2021, his collection is a central focus now of the spectacular New Museum M Plus in Hong Kong, under the title From Revolution to Globalization, a chronicle survey of the development of contemporary Chinese art from the 1970s through the 2000s, drawn from the M Plus Sik collection. Please welcome uh, Ai Weiwei, Uli Sik, and the moderator, Hans Ulrich Obrist. Yeah, thank you so much, BJ, and thank you all for, for being here. And I think before we start, we should all give a very big round of applause for Ai Weiwei and Uli Sik. A very warm welcome! We heard the uh, wonderful introduction this morning, of course, to the theme, the curatorial theme from Philipp Ursprung and the uh, many philosophers also who inspired us, uh, Ernst Bloch above all, who of course has also interesting connections to the Engadin. But it's also fascinating that contemporary philosophers like the Korean German philosopher Byung Chul Han continue with the theme today. He's working on a, a book on utopia saying that we need to basically tell a different world, think thoughts for a coming world, the spirit of hope uh, as opposed to a society of fear. Uh, and of course, that deeply relates to the fearless work of Ai Weiwei and Uli Sik. Uh, Byung Chul Han also says, die Hoffnung bezieht sich auf das noch nicht seiende, das noch nicht geborene. And this, of course, is referring to Adorno, who also 
has a connection to the Engadin. Our roads always lead to the Engadin. So Adorno said, hope refers to what is not yet, no? What is not yet born. So we will discuss today, as I promised to Weiwei, not so much about the past, only the first few minutes, and then we will talk about the extreme present and that what is not yet born. Um, we talk also about both uh, Weiwei's and Uli's unrealized project. But before that, I do think, as Beach has said, it's an extraordinary opportunity to have Weiwei and Uli together. It's a very rare occasion to have you both on a, on a panel. We've had so many conversations separately uh, before, but we never did a panel together. So I did want to ask you what I always wanted to ask you, how it all began. How did the two of you meet? Can you tell us about your first meeting? Well, <coughs> to sit here uh, on this stage with uh, Hans and Uli, I kind of realized I'm a Swiss product. <laughs> I just suddenly, you know, um, Hans is the first person announced my relevance that is rather very early, that even surprised Uli. Uli said, you know what Hans is saying about you? He said it's something, I cannot repeat the sentence. What Hans first announced to say I will wait is uh, some kind of, it's going to be very relevant in our time, something like that. Oh, one of the most relevant artists of our time. That yeah, is that, an expression. That is. surprised me because as Chinese, as a, someone really from outsider uh, of contemporary practice, or they have a different type of contemporary practice. So I, I always think, what's wrong with Hans's mind? <laughs> and uh, till now, I still haven't found out. We have 29 interviews together. <laughs> 29 interviews. That is, uh, even my interrogators uh, from the police, they only gave me 50 <laughs> interrogations. He almost matches that. And he, he said he's going to publish it. So Wooly is, uh, I always call him my maker. He introduced me to uh, the early uh, Korea. You know, it's very, very uh, unbelievable because before I had a regular gallery presents, I already got into museum shows or documenta or, you know, it's just a Venice. Um, yeah, so this is almost uh, impossible. I don't know what kind of magic he has. You know, he, it doesn't uh, look very powerful, but <laughs> certainly without his effort, I'm not going to sit in here. So maybe I, we should listen to your stories anyway. <laughs> well, um, what I can add to your introduction as to a way and me, the fearless person is him, not so much me. And uh, well, we met in 95 in his home at the time to answer your question. And uh, then we started a conversation that hasn't ended up to now and well, will continue for long, hopefully. And. Uh, Sometimes we agree, sometimes we disagree. We both are not always of our own opinion in our discussions, but uh, yeah, that's about the situation. The good thing about Swiss, when they are disagree, they never tell you they are disagree. <laughs> uh, except uh, uh, credit Swiss. <laughs> of, of course, it, it all. It all started in, in the embassy, and we met in 96, actually, because a year, year after your meeting, I came for the first time with Wuhan Ru to China, and we, we couldn't afford a hotel, so Uli kindly welcomed us to the embassy. And uh, it was an extraordinary experience. We worked on the show for Vienna, Cities on the Move, and the embassy was literally the headquarter of the Chinese art scene. It was a salon in the best possible sense, of artists and philosophers and poets talking. It was also a place where we saw the first works of um, uh, many, many of the Chinese artists uh, 
who are most well known today. Um, and I often think about that because I think, you know, there are dozens of Swiss embassies all over the world. There are thousands of embassies of other countries. Um, if more embassies would do that, uh, what you did with the embassy, something quite amazing could happen in embassy. Could you tell us about this, this miracle, what happened in that embassy? Because it was so inspiring for Hanru and me. We are still inspired by it. Well, I wouldn't want to nourish the idea that as ambassador, I just followed my passion for Chinese contemporary art. <laughs> Actually, uh, the task was uh, very all-encompassing from, uh, yes, cultural cooperation to uh, development cooperation to political analysis to economy <laughs> in particular at the time. And uh, as I came from the economy, as I had established the first joint venture with the outside world, which actually really is the beginning of globalization for China. Uh, so the tasks were enormous. But what helped me best to analyze China and do my research about China is actually the contemporary art and the contact, you know, with friends like Ai Weiwei, etc. And so, yeah, it was natural for me to open up the embassy to encounters. And um, also, I must admit, uh, the federal government had supplied to the embassy uh, all these very interesting paintings of the Zurich uh, concrete artists. But what, you know, maybe a triumph elsewhere in the West, of course, didn't stir any interest among the Chinese audience. You know, they would comment like, uh, well, uh, you know, my son could do this, <laughs> my monkey could do this. Uh, not very appreciative. So I started to put Chinese contemporary art on my walls. But that doesn't, but did not necessarily have a very different effect also, because <laughs> there was not much understanding yet for Chinese contemporary art. And as I promised that we wouldn't talk about the past too much, the last question about the past is this book, because that's an amazing thing you did together. Actually, so it's a conversation between the two of you and also our friend Jung Ho Chang, who was a very early architect, is a very early architect, one of the first architecture offices in, in China, and it was moderated by Peter Pakish and edited by Christina Brechtler in a series of books in 2009. And it's a book which is deeply connected, I think, to the topic also of today, because it's a book which is full of hope. Can you talk a little bit about this dialogue? Because what is interesting is that it has a lot to do with production of reality, it has a lot to do with Yu Weiwei also going into, into architecture. Um, and Uli, you said that you were both subject and object of this change. You talk about this enormous change of the open door policy. Um, yeah, it's, it would be interesting to just hear a little bit about that moment in, in 2009 and the, the book. And it was of course also connected, I mean, you facilitated, I think, Uli, the um, Olympic Stadium, Weiwei's involvement with Herzog Demeron also in the bird nest. So a lot of production of reality happened at that time. Uh, yes, that's very true. Do you want to start, Wei Wei? Or? No, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, of course, 2009 was already 29 years into the opening open door policy of China. And uh, it was an, an uh, well, unprecedented evolution in this huge country that had already happened by 2009. So 2009, China already looked much more like what it is today than at the beginning of the open door policy. And um, yes, we had some very diverse experiences. And one you mentioned is the bird's nest Olympic Stadium. And it all started, I think, 2003 when um, the architects, Herzog de Meron, uh, contacted me and um, together we did a trip to China so as to introduce them to China. And um, of course, I introduced Weiwei and them. And it so happened that on our very first encounter uh, through a friend of Ai Weiwei, uh, this 
project of the bird's nest to be built for the Olympics 2008 uh, appeared. And uh, well, that was the beginning of a very interesting cooperation um, between all of us, Herzog Demerol, Weiwei, me. And at that time, there was a lot of Western design buildings all over China emerging. And to us, it was very clear that if we want to succeed in a competition, it was a, for a competition, uh, it would be very important that uh, the Chinese public could somehow allude and associate itself with whatever would be built, not the Western solitaire as many of those had been built at the time. And uh, that was actually Weiwei's main task, to, to bring imagery, to bring uh, impressions, to bring suggestions that would make it possible for the Chinese public to identify. And um, of course, not to copy. Copy, the Chinese can do much better. So he, he made important inputs as to the shape. The, the name bird's nest came later. Uh, was assigned by the Chinese public, actually. And Weiwei, you also say something really important in this book. Uh, there's a, because you worked at that time on all these large-scale projects, so like the Yibo River Bank, this amazing, very large-scale architectural project. And you say there's a kind of a difference with land art, no? with Walter de Maria, where you know, art kind of competes with nature, no? uh, with these land art projects. Uh, and you feel that... Uh, in China, there is more in these large-scale projects you were involved with maybe an understanding of our own space in nature, so it's not a competition with nature. There's a whole chapter on that. Well, it uh, sounds very philosophical, and uh, you know, I have such bad memory in, to memorize what I have said. You know, that protects me so well. And, but uh, I, I guess uh, that's... Uh, I think uh, if we look at the human effort, especially at the today. We think, uh, yes, we, we, we think we are so special, but uh, we always have to remember we're just uh, 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 some kind of miracle here. Or even we just think we are the mir miracle. And we are, but uh, that can be easily not existing or disappearing. So with that kind of contact, we, I think, uh, uh, yes, the kind of effort, art or other technology or, or the political struggles or even ideology. Uh, it's really a human's self-indulgent. And, uh, you know, it's, it's great we, we have that kind of indulgency, but still I think that compared to the nature is uh, it's almost, we're just part of nature, uh, according to uh, uh, Chinese philosophy, and uh, yeah. Also, more or less at that time, and that brings us then to now, it also connects to Kenneth Roth's uh, talk before, I know about the idea that art is not only portray um, cruelty or injustice, but that there is a, a defiance, and uh, that's something which starts more or less at that time in your work. You started to research the students who died in the Sichuan earthquake in 2008. That was right before the Olympics opened. And uh, piece by piece, you found the names, the schools, 5,019 students, and you felt um, a great sense of urgency. And it's never stopped since then. You continued to do many such campaigns. More recently, very near um, where I live, in London, in, uh, at Hyde Park Corner. It's also a connection to uh, what we just heard in the previous speech with the white page. Can you talk a little bit about what happened in 2008 with this awakening with Sichuan and how you pushed that to so many different campaigns? Thank you. By 2005, um, I started to get it on internet. I, that was the invitation from a state uh, internet uh, group. They said, uh, where well, we have so many opinions and uh, so many young people like to listen to you, why don't you open a blog? I told them I never touched the computer, I don't know how to type. So, you know, I'm, I'm quite an educated person. And they said, don't oh, worry, come on, you know, we can, you can learn very fast. So I get on my computer, but from that time, 2005, 
I just had my first show in, in Switzerland again, you know, in Bern, Hauskong uh, Bern, uh, the director, um, uh, Phoebe Her. So he gave me a show again. Uli Sik introduced me to, to this uh, little but very beautiful art location. So I got on the internet, I would say I spend all my time on, online. I write articles three, four a day. My article next morning, there's no next morning in the internet. You just, any time you open it up, you see, oh, 300 people, thousand people has been reporting it, or reposted it. And I become so popular. And uh, I said, that this, is, this is a miracle. In the history of human history, or Chinese, not even to mention this, Chinese history, no individual ever can write his personal opinions and uh, to give it to the public, and pe people can discuss and criticize. So I think I'm living in such like a dream land, but that dream shattered very, it was very short time. By 2009, all my blogs have been shut down. My name cannot even be posted. I changed it maybe 500 times on my names. And uh, they all can recognize it's me. So, um, but 2008, that's the Olympics. That's when we designed this burn nest. It's be supposed to be the glamour of the nation and uh, the Communist Party. So I realized that and I am the first person to openly criticize the possibility because the Chinese official already told the people the best thing to, to, to celebrate the Olympics is to stay at home and watch television and all the migrants have to leave the city. And even foreigners, they, they limited the possibility for foreigners to, to stay in the city. So they would have this uh, fantastic party and uh, that's, that's the point I divide myself uh, from, uh, uh, you know, still working with the state structure, but I'd rather to go, uh, you know, but May 12th, Sichuan earthquake, devastating. 90s, 90s, um, well, 90,000 people disappeared. So among them, there's 5,000 students. So I would only argue about that is because the schools are built by government, and the school collapsed before hospitals or neighborhood. The buildings standing next to school is not collapsing. So I start asking questions about uh, corruption or doleful construction. Of course, nobody liked to hear about it. So I did my investigation. I relocated about 5,219 students' name, birthday, which school, which class, and we interviewed their parents. So I realized the most powerful thing is to do investigations, to, to find out the real numbers, and to ask the very essential questions to tell people how to respect life and never forget. So that's the short story. Thank you, and you've done, of course, many such investigations since, among them also related to COVID and Wuhan, but we don't have the time to talk about all of them. But more recently, you've done quite a lot in London, uh, connected actually also to the theme of hope. Um, earlier this month, you read a message from the Dalai Lama commissioned by Sarkar at Piccadilly, which is, we must continually consider the oneness of humanity, remembering that we all want to be happy, and indeed everyone has a right to a happy life. Along the way, we may be faced with problems, but we must not lose hope. We must keep up our determination without being impatient to achieve quick results. And then, as well, at the very end of the year, in High Park Corner, you did this um, project for Human Rights Day, and I think it connects beautifully to the previous talk, where you did a performance with A4 pieces, but the ink was invisible. And as far as I understand, also all the benefits of this project went to Refugees International. Can you tell us about this most recent project? Most recently, I mean the A4 yeah. protest? Well, I am a bit uh, skeptical when 
about protesting in general. You know, we see protesting, all kind of protesting everywhere. And uh, in Europe, in many troubled land, different continent, even in the United States. And uh, very often, it doesn't work that well, you know, from my personal perspective. Yes, you can protest, and uh, you know, and uh, it's almost like uh, everything being channeled or being programmed and uh, then, f then finished. Because I, I always think the state, the power are really use, use your own an energy to waste this at all. You know, it's, it's, I don't think it works that well. In, it doesn't matter. In, uh, authoritarian society or even democratic society. That's my, uh, my feeling. But to hold a white paper, of course, is very symbolic. But still, I think uh, that is very, uh, very ironic. You know, uh, who cares? Uh, you know, when New York Times two days ago, they're posting, that's very important for Germans to give the tanks to Russian. I, I counted it's about 14 tanks or something like that. So that would on front page. So you would always ask what is really relevant if we talk about society, we talk about the, our today's politics and also its issues because you know people are dying and people are struggling and uh, there's all, almost 100 million refugees today without home. And uh, who cares? That's them, it's not us. So to hold a white paper, uh, it's a little bit uh, strange, but uh, still. When this beautiful events ask me to design something for the hope, I don't know, I, have the, I don't have the bag. I just simply cannot do the hope I made. The other side is less hopeless. Uh, hopeless hope, or hope hopeless, I think that always should be related. Why we, we need help? Because we are hopeless. Thank you so much, and that's a great moment to maybe ask you both concretely about hope and how you would define or see hope. I mean, Gerhard Richter says art is the highest form of hope. And maybe we start with Wei Wei and then with Uli about, about hope. Wei Wei, you, in a recent a uh, conversation you gave to, to Monopole, actually for Engelin Artox, you said hope is essentially the fantasy or hypothesis of the possible that is impossible to achieve. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, hope is a word, I think, uh, I think when I was very young, my father was exiled. I, I grew up with him. The exile life, in China, it's very tough. It's almost like, uh, it's not human life. So we, we leave a uh, dugout underground. He cleans the toilet. And uh, you know, he was the poet for the nation, represent Chinese literature, and uh, studied in Paris, and uh, fight with communists, and his comrades with uh, Chairman Mao, or Xi Jinping's father, Xi Zhongxin. You know, they, they're all same group. So he's so powerful, and he was so insulted, and so discriminated for this kind of crime. He never made a crime, he's, he's a poet. So, of course, I see him going out in the morning to, you know, trying to clean these 13 toilets for the farmers, comes back in the evening. You know, the temperature can be 20, 30 degrees below, in the winter and 30, 40 degrees above zero in the summer. So this man never had physical work, has to do all those kind of things. You know, it's, he told me, he said, I'm 60 years old. I never cleaned my toilet before. So why I can't clean toilet for others? That I cannot argue with him. Then he told my mom, said, we should think we were born here. And uh, if you don't have hope, you will not feel hopeless. That's the first lesson I get. 
So I never really liked the words hope, and I never liked the words freedom. I think this is probably the most empty words existing in our conversation. Goes back to what Christina quoted of uh, Barbara Stauffacher Solomon in an interesting way, no? which the video which um, Elena Fasto will introduce tomorrow. But Uli, what's your take on hope? Because it's interesting because you've actually, uh, Bicha mentioned your extraordinary collection, the collection which is now in parts, in important parts at, at M Plus in, in Hong Kong. But what's so interesting is that the collection is not only at M Plus, but that you have for years curated and organized exhibitions uh, of your collections, always different aspects, really on all continents. So, and I, as far as I understand, one of your exhibitions had particularly to do with this idea of the theme of hope, but also how it somehow connects to the past. I mean, how maybe the future can be invented with fragments uh, from the past. Can you tell us maybe first about this exhibition and how it connects to hope? And then I have more questions. Yeah. Um, well, I have to be very modest as, you know, when we listen to Mr. Gauk and to Ai Weiwei, because they experienced the change from one system to another, while we are just observers, and I was, I was there, but just as observer. So, back to the exhibitions. Um, just one exhibition made me think of uh, hope and the topic of this symposium. In particular, uh, I did an exhibition about uh, Chinese tradition, about, in particular, landscape painting, which is a pillar of Chinese tradition, and how the contemporary artists see their own tradition, and digging into the Chinese tradition, and of course, Wei Wei will correct me in a moment, um, looking at almost a thousand years of, of uh, landscape painting, um, you see a very different paradigm at work than the one in contemporary art. Uh, it's the purpose of art in, in that thinking is lead you to lead the viewer to beauty, to harmony, to the sublime. So there art is uh, your good friend. It's your doctor in a way. And then looking at the contemporary art in China and other Asian spaces. Uh, of course, contemporary art, art is not your good friend. It's not your doctor. It's more your pain. So the analytical character, critical character, and all that is so different from this other traditional paradigm. And you question yourself, What's the merit of that traditional paradigm, bringing you to beauty, to the sublime? If we look at contemporary art, uh, there isn't much hope, in fact. I mean, we saw images just now, some of them art, some of them not, or without this aspiration. There is not much hope in the current contemporary art. But what you could see uh, in the traditional paradigm is um, beauty and hope, maybe also escapism. Maybe if there is no space for hope, you know, then art may turn to escapism. So that's just where I saw a kind of link to what we discussed today, uh, that beauty, the sublime and all that has very little space in contemporary art. And uh, I'm you know, not making a value judgment, but maybe hope, belongs, and that's a strength of the traditional Asian, or in particular, Chinese paradigm. Thank you so much, Uli. Wei, would you agree with that? I was taking videos. I lost a big part of it. <laughs> oh, so, you can. <laughs> so you think about that later. <laughs> yeah, the question to tradition, really, because it's interesting, when Uli was asking, when you were asking in an interview once, what is your favorite um, work, actually, of your collection, um, you once said that 
the Coca-Cola urn of Ai Weiwei is one of your favorite works. And that kind of connects because we have a clash here, because there is, of course, a millennia-old Chinese tradition, and then there is a kind of a Western industrial and consumer culture. There's a clash. Maybe it connects to that. Yeah, well, maybe you are the author of this thing, uh, which, of which causes, me, causes me currently a, a big problem, or, or better, to the end plus museum, because that Coca-Cola logo is fading rapidly. So <laughs> it's maybe a detail, but how to deal with that fact? Uh, that you know, maybe in a few years, this will only be a Han Dynasty urn, and nothing else. So you know, that also asks questions about cultures. About cultures, maybe does it? It may mean that the Chinese culture, in the end, will prevail <laughs> over the Western culture, which is not what we heard previously. We're going to open it up in a minute. I have uh, two last questions, very quickly, which is: So Adorno said, quote by byung Chul Han, die Hoffnung bezieht sich auf das noch nicht Seinde, das noch nicht Geborene. And uh, I'm always very interested about unrealized projects, as you know, because we know very little about artists, collectors, philanthropists, poets, unrealized projects. The only kind of uh, profession where we know a little bit about unrealized projects is architecture, because architects, through competition, sometimes publish their unrealized projects. Uh, and I think it's interesting, the range of the unrealized is very broad. Projects can be too big to be realized, too small to be realized, too expensive to be realized, too time intense to be realized, which just sometimes hasn't, doesn't have the time to do it. That can be censorship, that can be a reason for an unrealized project. And as Doris Lessing once told me, it can also be projects we don't dare to do, no? Like she called that self-censorship, that can be another reason. So within that whole range, of the unrealized, I wanted to ask you both to tell us about one or two of your unrealized projects, something you haven't been able to do yet. Well, I, um, I'm in Portugal. I settled myself in Portugal now, so uh, that's why I feel quite, uh, quite short, culture shock when sitting in the middle of you. Because Portugal is a land, uh, take a long nap, and 16th century, and uh, you know they skipped the uh, Industrial Revolution. They don't know that much about the uh, uh, Renaissance, but that's why I like it there because it's really a place uh, uh, you can take a long nap. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I decided to build a studio there, and uh, the people. Are Super nice. They are very sincere. They are really honest. They really want to do uh, do my um, studio uh, in Portugal. Uh, why I'm doing a studio? Because I think I have to create some problems. If I am a person without problem, I cannot survive. So to build a studio in Portugal, I realize it's really a a, a big problem uh, because uh, nobody comes uh, on time. You know. <laughs> And even you know the, the bright sunshine days and uh, you know weekends nobody there for sure, and uh, I always compare it to China. Everybody wants to work. Doesn't matter. You know all those uh, migrant works work the whole year. There's no weekends. There's no. They don't go to church and they, they want to have the New Year's holiday for one month to go back to their child and uh, to see their mom. But the rest of time. The only method is about working, working hard, making money, but nothing happens in Europe. Extremely cases Portugal, but I'm still, you know, have been working on this uh, project for over two years. They promised me they will finish by this year, but uh, I think uh, the definition of one year is different. <laughs> in there, so I'm, I'm more or less get used to it, <laughs> and that's one of my projects. And I have another one. Uh, uh, very uh, soon, I'll be uh, presented in the London Design Museum. I I would have my show about. Uh, they asked me to say, "Where well, you did so many uh, buildings and uh, designs, and you know." Uh, uh, the, a guy, a good guy, uh, Tim Miller, said, uh, you know, why don't we do a, a show about the design, uh, the design you did. 
I, yes, I agree, and I, I love him, but only I, because I love friends. You know, I, I think friends is so, so rare in our life. So, but to do a show about the design, so I have to rethink about what is the design and uh, you know, how these words come out and uh, you know, why, you know, what we refer to design in contemporary language. So I, I want to give a show to give a, my definition about design. So that will open on April 7th in London. So. Great, thank you so much. And Uli, of course, when we spoke in the past, you often told me your unrealized, one of your unrealized projects is, of course, the fact that there is a permanent place where parts of your collections are shown, and that has now happened at M+. Can you tell us about your still unrealized projects, your next unrealized projects? Uh, well, it's, it's true that one has really been realized. It's a place for the Chinese contemporary art, for the storyline of Chinese contemporary art, which doesn't exist anywhere else. So it's, it's not easy to find an adequate other uh, goal. And uh, I have talked a bit about it. It's about this paradigm of contemporary art, which is not known or which is known to only a small part of the Asian and in particular Chinese population. So they are not aware of the role, positive role, contemporary art can play in terms of analyzing, suggesting, uh, even creating hope at times, uh, what it can do for society. It's still a, a very different view. So I'm working, and my hope is, of course, I will never reach it. That, uh, and that's part of hope, right, by definition, that um, I can advance more understanding for this paradigm of what contemporary art is. I but I cannot have, you know, these crazy ideas and even realize them as Weiwei does. I mean, that could not be a better conclusion. And now we open it up. Do we have questions? Yes, we have a question here. If you could have the microphone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the question is, do, do you think or what do you think about the hope of living all together the American consumer's culture, the European culture, and the Chinese, how it's evolving. And I feel most of the time we raise the positive things from the American way, the European way, and we focus on what is not working in China. And I rarely heard raising great things as well happening in China and what is not working. So do you think there is a hope that we reach a certain level where everyone continue to live in their way and culture? And I think art, it's definitely a big part of it. Thank you. It's you, for you. No, no, for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it's for you. You are the real Chinese. Huh? You are the real Chinese, so. So what is the question? <laughs> <laughs> The hope of living together? Huh? It's about the hope of living together, as far as I understand. Yeah, and I understand. What, what is the contribution? And what's the contribution of China? So it's about the hope of living culture. together and what the contribution of China can okay. be in that? Is that, is okay. that correct? Yeah. Does that summarize it? Yeah. Well, okay, cool. Well, I, 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 I try to answer that. I think we have to live together. Doesn't matter, Chinese, Russians, or whoever. We have to live together. This is just a little village, a planet. And everything has to affect us, anybody even, their life, their, their, their mistake or whatever, it will affect every of us. So, and not to even mention China is 1.4 billion people there. And they, are, they have a strong culture and they have their own way of behaving in many times surprise us, but uh, still, we have to work together. There's no other way. Sorry, my answer may be too simplified, but... No, thank you. We have more questions or comments. Yes, we've got a question here in the back, in the third last row. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, 
You just said there's little hope in contemporary art in China. Would you care to paint the picture a bit more detailed and maybe share perspectives on what excites you in the landscape of Chinese thinking and art? And maybe where you see hotspots that do give you hope. And maybe you could differentiate between mainland China and exile China. That'd be interesting. Again, it's a question for me. What is that? Please, a question yeah, for, for everyone about what excites you about. Uh, so, also about the younger generation, you mean? Yeah. yeah. About emerging artists in China, both in China but also Chinese artists abroad who are in exile. Yeah. Uh, is this addressed to, to you. him, to me? Uh, okay. Uh, what interests me most and uh, what's not easy to answer is uh, the role of the Chinese artist vis-à-vis -vis the mainstream, global mainstream. And a Chinese artist kind of has to take a decision as to, uh, well, competing, finding a place in this global mainstream only very, very few will be as successful as he is to find a place also in this global mainstream. And how to do that? Is it uh, by you know, adopting the visual world of this global mainstream as we know it mainly from Western art? Or is it by difference, by you know, digging maybe into your own roots of your own culture? That's where a difference may come from. So the artists are faced with such a decision or at times a decision instead of bearing this risk of really being able to join this global mainstream successfully, uh, try to be a hero in your own country and just adopt you know, like traditional styles which may have a huge audience uh, in that particular culture but not beyond. I also so think that I, I'm very interested to ask you know, or to answer regarding my own position, how this conflict, uh, the way I have identified it, he may see it very differently, will play out. I, th I think this is more related to the, the thinking of uh, globalization. And uh, if we replace art, the words, with uh, cooking or food, we can understand better. Um, you know, it's very hard to judge which kind of cooking is better or, you know, there's Japanese, there's Chinese, there's the Indian, there's uh, German and, uh, you know, Swiss probably. But it's really about uh, what we are used to and it relates to our memory, our habit. So, uh, I, I think it should be that way. Actually, I hate those kind of fusion food, you don't know what you're eating, and uh, someone has to tell you what you're eating. I think uh, I don't like that kind of uh, food. I like to have the food I can memorize, and maybe it's from someone's grandma or someone, you know. It, it has memory, and we are living a time trying to destroy the memory, and trying to make the you know, trying to destroy the indifferent, uh, you know, differences. So that, I think, is, uh, is more dangerous. I think uh, they should go their own way. They should die their own way. I think we can take one last question. I just want to say one thing about your question about the emerging generation. So in my research, what I think is interesting is also not only in China, but globally, but it happens very strongly in China, is that a new generation of artists, and it connects really to what Wei Wei said earlier about togetherness, no? That that sort of togetherness gets more and more articulated through the medium of video games. You know, if you look at Liu Yang, but even now a younger generation after, a lot of artists in China work with video games in a very different way than these AAA games, you know, sort of artists inventing their own world, it's world building. And um, I started to kind of research in that direction, and I think there is definitely super interesting things happening where artists do games which are super, interest, super different from the commercial games and really think about, you know, how we can create togetherness and not separation. 
love and not suspicion, you know, a common future and not isolation, as Etta Lanan said, through that medium, you know, of video game, and not forgetting that 2.8 billion people in the world, that's a third of the world population last year, have engaged with video games, and that the average age is 35. So it's not a coincidence that more and more artists of the younger generation kind of go there. Maybe, Be maybe you're going to talk about the Bitcoin. <laughs> that would be a whole other talk, yeah. <laughs> totally. We have a question here. Yes, thank you uh, for already mentioning world building because my question is directly connected to that. Um, you were discussing the relevance of utopianism and also this kind of escapism that art could get back to probably because we can't find hope in the real world anymore. And um, President Gauck also mentioned um, the relevance of not just observing but building. And my question is, um, how do you think we could make use of the building of and the migration to virtual or digital spaces to kind of get back to finding hope. How could we make use of these spaces? Acoustically, I'm not, not fully clear. Yeah, so I think how we could use this, it may connect very much to what we just said before, the question of, you know, how digital spaces could, you know, um, what, what potential there maybe is, because there are, of course, as we know, I suppose that's what the question alludes to us, a lot of downsides, you know, um, of these digital media, of social media, but what could be the positive sides? Is that the question? Yeah. Did I understand correctly? You so what could be answer, the positive side? Yeah, I mean, I already, <laughs> no, I already tried before, but it would be great to hear you. I mean, you've engaged so much, Wei Wei, with the digital. I remember when we did China Power Station, in 2007, with the Serpentine in Battersea, we translated your blog for the first time, and you mentioned that before, and ever since, you know, you've worked a lot with digital media. It would be great to hear from you, and then, of course, also from Uli, how, because Uli has pioneered as a collector one of the very first digital artwork, which was community building, you know, by Sao Fei, one of the first Chinese artwork, when, which we also showed at the Serpentine with the R&B cities. So I think you both have exciting things to say about that. Well, I, I'm a bit hopeless on that, and uh, <laughs> uh, maybe you give some hope. <laughs> well, it's about hope, that's yet another dimension, but uh, it's that project you were referring to, uh, RMB City, RMB is the Chinese currency, and it was a project by the, uh, that time, very young female artist, Tao Fei, and uh, she created uh, in, um, Second Life, which still exists, but now is of no significance anymore, an artwork. She created a city, uh, RMB city, taking imagery from Beijing city, and, uh, well, we established exhibitions in there, even an opera was conducted in there. Uh, that was 2008 to 2011. I was the first mayor of RMB City, and uh, this was the metaverse, as it was called at the time. So today we talk about metaverse, but actually, you know, the word already existed. But Weiwei has much more exciting things well, well. to tell what <coughs> occurred to him using the, you know, social media. Yeah, social media, I, I work on it. It's not really for virtual reality, but really focused on reality. So that gave me a very close context to the people or locations or, or events. So, you know, the police used to say to me, said, well, you are artists, but you did work as journalists or, or as lawyers. So I, 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 I'm quite proud of that. I, I'm a, you know, I'm a, uh, but there's always people ask me to do some kind of virtual reality. I would tell them uh, I'm still fascinated about reality. Of so I, I cannot do virtual reality, so I, that's why I never did a, a, a work uh, a virtual reality. Probably I did one with uh, uh, to make a drawing on the moon with uh, you know my 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 friend uh, uh, my neighbor <laughs> artist uh, Oliver. <laughs> And uh, that's the only thing we did, and uh, you know, to, to 
It's just a gesture. I, I still have a problem to work. Uh, or I would definition, uh, give a definition is my work on internet uh, uh, or my writings or commentaries on Twitter or Instagram is my art. So I don't have to create a form of art because it's existing ready made. So. Great, I have a very last question. Uh, I have to ask that question because it's a wonderful question Philip um, asked President Gauck. It's the, what I call the Rainer Maria Rilke question. You know, the advice to a young practitioner, artist, architect, um, philanthropist, collector, poet, you know, just to the future generation. Uh, Rainer Maria Rilke wrote this wonderful little book, Advice to a Young Poet. And so I wanted to ask Wei Wei and Mayor Sick, we now know that Uli is also mayor, that's breaking news. What? So, so I wanted, in, in, in the metaverse, Mayor Sick in the metaverse. So I wanted to ask Wei Wei and Uli, what would be your advice to a, to a future generation? Wei Wei, your advice to a, to a young artist. Well, you, you better give a good response, well, you have when, some. I will, I will tell you a story, when, you know, when the demonstration or this COVID uh, zero happens, the police would kick the door and uh, pull, pull all the people to, to do this kind of daily COVID testing or something like that twice a day or something. So then I think one incident is a young guy, you know, he's a little bit uh, against that kind of policy. So the police says, you know, if you're doing that, it will affect you and your next generation, you know, the, they can do that. So that, that young man just said to him, we're the last generation. So I think that is very powerful statement is on, on Chinese internet, everybody talking about it. So China is facing a, a crisis when they had this one child policy before. The, the, so this year is uh, crazily the, 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 the births uh, uh, are become negative, you know, not, not, not so much enough births, uh, n n never happening in the past six years, and they realize that they become an orderly society. And uh, under the young generation, simply they don't want to give birth, they don't even want to get married, they, they cannot afford their life. So, so we talk about the, the, to ask that kind of question. If I talk to Chinese, I cannot answer it. You know, it's not possible. It's everything's political. Thank you, and Uli. Uh, I would, I would have said early, in earlier times, don't do anything I wouldn't do. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Uli. Thank you so much, Wei Wei. Thank you so Thank much. You. Yes, Thank, Thank you. 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 Thank you.